podcast where I had the incredible chance to be on the Melissa main show. If you don't know it, check it out with the one and only Melissa McAllister. Being interviewed on Melissa's podcast was amazing. And of course, we covered everything you need to know to start feeling your best using functional medicine. So let's dive right in and explore everything you need to know to take your health to the next level. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. I'll see you guys soon. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Lesson Made Show. So I've got a guest today uh, that you are going to fall in love with. And if you're by chance not following her, she will be an instant follow and someone that you're going to learn from extensively. I want to give her a proper introduction, but I'm very excited to talk to her. And like I was just telling her before we started this episode, that I just think the universe puts people in my way intentionally. And she is one of them. I love how she teaches. I love the topics that she talks about every day. I get questions in my inbox that she references and that she teaches on. So this is going to be uh, one of those that you're going to have to listen to probably more than once. You're going to want to have a pen and paper. You're going to want to follow her and you're going to enjoy her. She's prepared to hear me probably mutilate her beautiful name. Uh, we probably spent 10 minutes on it. Efrat Lamondre. Uh, is there any? Yay. <laughs> It's a beautiful name. And we're, from this point out, we're going to call her Dr. E. She's a PhD and she invented the new method where she empowers people to finally realize that their symptoms are not in their heads. How powerful is that? Conventional medicine has its limits and often doesn't address the root cause. Now, using functional medicine, Dr. E helps people with autoimmune diseases, hormonal imbalances, insulin resistance, and general, I don't feel good itis. Does that sound like you? <laughs> I know a lot of you right now are like, oh my gosh, you just described me to a T. And so I just want to start this off, Dr. E, with can you just give us a little bit of background on what's taking you to where you are today from, you know, maybe the uh, the conventional medicine route or why you specialize in what you do compared to just uh, conventional medicine? First of all, thank you. I'm honored to be here. And thank you to everyone who's listening. I hope you're washing your dishes and mowing your lawn and you're going to keep it interesting. <laughs> uh, so the way I got into functional medicine and where I realized that everyone gets into functional medicine is either because they've hit a roadblock or someone that they love hits a roadblock. So I started off in conventional medicine, you know, my first degree is nurse practitioner, family medicine. And I opened up a company called EG Healthcare, which is primary care, just like when you go to your doctor's office and everything was great. And we serve over 25,000 patients. And I didn't think people would come to me and say, I don't feel good. And I would run the labs and everything was fine. And I would say, you're good. I'll see you next year. And I had no idea how disempowering that was because I really was doing everything wholeheartedly for my patients and all the labs were fine. So you're fine. And I could have gone on like that for the rest of my life because nothing would have told, told me that it's wrong or not enough, I should say, until my wife got sick. And she got sick and she's in medicine. I'm in medicine. We both met in the ER. All our friends are in medicine. And we hit a roadblock. We had two autoimmune issues. And the only thing available to us was heavy duty medication. And we knew there was a better way, which is why I called the new method, by the way, because the patients know. So we knew. And we just, this was kind of pre-internet days. So somebody told us this crazy person who does functional medicine. No one even heard of it back then. And we went fully knowing that it's not going to help us. Because we're educated, we're in medicine, and all our friends are in medicine. We know everything. He told us that we have to change our nutrition, which is outrageous because nutrition has nothing to do with health, of course. <laughs> um, and because we never learned that in school. And to boot, we thought we were really eating healthy. We were, you know, in shape people, whatever that means. So we changed it. We changed our nutrition because we have nothing to lose. Like, why not? And we did it. And her, our lives were completely given back to us. She had two autoimmune issues, just to understand. The first one's called PMLE, polymorphous light eruption. Basically, it means an allergy to the sun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we like, we would decide when we're going outside, like we live like vampires. And then the second was severe psoriasis, so severe that like her feet would bleed and her hands would bleed. And it was, it was really affecting our daily living. And within a month, her psoriasis was completely gone and she was able to go out into the sun. So I was like, what is this witchcraft? Voodoo. <laughs> this is nonsense. So, you know, I started one class and another class, another class. And before you know it, you're just down the rabbit hole. And I started bringing it back to my patients. And then ultimately I developed the new method, like a separate entity, because it is two different types of patients. Not everybody wants this. And so I created a separate entity for it. And it's become my passion. I, I can't unsee what I've learned. 
And so this is how I am here today. I love that. And I know every person, you know, is so individual. And But I'm curious, listening to what your wife went through, did, did you find anything, especially for the psoriasis, that was particularly helpful in helping her heal it so quick? I mean, you, I know you had mentioned diet, but was there anything specific with that that was just like, wow? <laughs> well, now years later, I know that anyone who has skin issues has belly issues. Skin is belly. Skin is the neon side, uh, neon sign on the outside. It's letting you know, hey, we're not happy on the inside. That's all it is. You could topple yourself all day long. All you're doing is managing flares, but you're actually not getting to the root cause. Until you fix your belly, your skin's not going to be right. Yeah. Hundred percent. I love that. And I was just binge watching your uh, Instagram as well. And coincidentally, I went to get my well woman exam. Uh, I think I shared this on a previous podcast uh, just a couple of months ago. It took me six months to see her. She was sought after and had the well woman exam. And I wanted to have my levels checked. And so, you know, including hormones and including uh, thyroid and all that. And she's like, sure. And when I got the results back, the only thing that she tested was TSH. <laughs> and I just oh, watched the thyroid. Okay. Yes, my thyroid. And so I would love, for, and this is something that I share with uh, my clients all the time about the complete panel. With your expertise, will you share a little bit about, you know, if, if you feel not well, uh, you know, always get the thyroid checked, but don't fall into thinking that if your TSH is fine, that you need to move on to something else because it's obviously not your thyroid because that could be, couldn't be farther from the truth. Sure. So let's talk about why providers only do the TSH. They do the TSH and you, and I always do want to tell everyone who's listening, your providers are great. They're wonderful people. They have no malice. They're not evil. They're not in big pharma's pocket. It doesn't work that way. I have a medical practice. Big pharma's not coming and I haven't allowed to buy his coffee. That's not how it is. It's just we're taught a certain algorithm. And the algorithm states that you do a TSH. And only if the TSH is off, do you then explore further. So that is the algorithm. Because the mindset is the TSH is fine. So if the TSH is off, I'll medicate you. If the TSH is fine, there's nothing I could do. So all that data is meaningless in the conventional setting because I can't medicate you. Right. So... So that's why they're doing that. But what we know with autoimmune thyroid issues, whether it's hyper or hypo, is that it takes years before the thyroid is affected. So you can have an autoimmune issue for years, 10 years, 20 years, and your TSH will be fine. All that means is that your thyroid is producing. Your thyroid is doing its function. It's producing. It's getting hammered by your autoimmunity, but it's producing. That's what the TSH. TSH is like, so it's producing, so it's fine. But wouldn't it be nice to know that it's being hammered? So if you could find out that it's being hammered, just like we like to know for pre-diabetic, for pre-diabetic, then we want to know, hey, let me make some lifestyle changes right now so that I don't become diabetic. And we have, it's called an A1C, and we do that all the time. With thyroid, we have it also, which is antibody levels. You could have positive antibody levels for decades, and your thyroid is performing fine, but it's working really hard to perform fine. So you might have some symptoms, and that is why that TSH is not enough. So then you might say, and a lot of conventional providers will say, well, what's the point? There's no medication for antibodies. Why would I do distress my patients? And it is distressful because I've had patients where I'm like, in conventional medicine, and I'm like, hey, you have antibodies, but well, what can I do about it? In a conventional medicine setting, nothing. Mm -hmm. In functional medicine setting, if for that patient, I'll say, okay, it's really time to go gluten-free. It's really time to bring down your inflammation because that antibody is there, the autoimmunity is there, but we could probably stop that inflammation so that it never becomes a thyroid problem. And that is that is the crucial difference, that in functional medicine, our interventions are more than just medication. And so knowing that information, there's actually a lot of action we could do about it. Whereas in conventional medicine, there's kind of like, well, you have antibodies, what am I going to do for you? Nothing. So right. that's the difference. So probably 1% of my following actually watches the YouTube video of this. That has to be one of the best descriptions of thyroid and, you know, all of the different hormones that are associated with your thyroid that I have ever heard that was just beautifully put. And and I appreciate that you have that gift and that you share it with other people to be able to share those kind of things, which just makes me have a 200 page list of questions I want to ask you because <laughs> I want to steal the way that you share things. <laughs> but, you know, talking about thyroid, which, you know, I'm almost going to be 50 in February. And so age, you know, is an issue and things start to get sluggish and stuff like that. 
but one of the things that I think you're you're very good at talking with people about is something happening because of your age, because you are getting older. When is age truly like the reason versus something that we're kind of using as an excuse for maybe not feeling as good as we could? Yes. Oh, my God. And yes, biohacking. I love that word. It sounds fancy, but it really it's it's not like we could all do it. So yeah. let me break it down. Of course, there are certain things that physically are happening as we age, right? Our kidney values go down, our, our hair turns gray. There are certain things that are 100% inevitable as we as we age. But a lot of the things that we've come to accept as part of aging is really a, a more of the fact that we've been living a certain way for so long and it's catching up to us. Mm -hmm. So we will give an example. Everyone feels like, oh, I'm 50. That's why all my joints hurt. Is that is that really because you're 50 or is it because the past 30 years you've been eating the standard American diet causing inflammation mm -hmm. and you have been able to kind of metabolize it or it hasn't caught up to you and now it's catching up to you. And the reason I say that is because that that's one of the biggest complaints we have. I have aches and pains all the time. Can't bend down big on my grandkid. I can't even bend down tie my shoe. And then we clean up their belly and guess what? They're bending down again. I did not change their age. All right. I did, right? All I did was remove their inflammation. That's a biohack. The biohack means like, Yes, I'm on the planet for 50 years, but I've just changed the trajectory, not only of my aches and pains, but those aches and pains eventually will also become a disease. So I've just reversed disease. So, and I get this question a lot, like, what do you mean, you know, you people aren't going to die and, you know, you can't live forever. True. Of course, you can't live forever. We can't, but we can live well for a much longer time. Than this. What's happened in our, in our age from many of us is that our friends to the left, our friends to the right, are just as unwell as we are. So we think it's normal. They're on a blood pressure medicine, you're on a blood pressure medicine, they're on cholesterol medicine. Then they also, you know, groan every time they get out of the chair. So then this must be 50. But no, this this is all because you guys are all eating at the same restaurants. And you know, <laughs> right. So so it's that more than the age. It it, it really is. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they say that you, you know, you become the five people you hang around. I mean, I I just heard that yesterday again, and it's such a, a, a true quote that, you know, you tend to surround yourself with. And, and I know you're a woman that's very big into business as well. So it's not even just health, but even in the business realm of things, if you surround yourself with people that are very driven to do well in business or people that are very driven to age well, you're going to follow suit with those people as opposed to if you are right now in a journey of trying to be a happier and healthier person, yet the five people that you hang out with always kind of give you a hard time about that, you know? Oh, live a little, you know, that's not going to kill you. One more drink isn't a big deal. You know, just go ahead and eat that. What's this gluten thing you're not eating? <laughs> it really does make a big difference who you surround yourself with. I appreciate that. In the beginning, when I said the people are the universe, God, mother nature, whoever you believe in, uh, just puts people in your path. I told uh, Dr. E that when I read her, her little sheet, I was like, she loves fasting. <laughs> And I, I obviously you can attest to this. We did not talk about it beforehand. It was, I didn't, you know, I didn't go find you because I'm like, she's going to affirm how much intermittent fasting is important to me. Um, it was just something that I read coincidentally right before this interview, but I would love for you to share your thoughts on uh, fasting uh, and what you, how you use it maybe with your patients. There's no question that fasting is part of the picture. Um, how much we can debate that's you know, but there's no question. And this is not a conversation of weight loss. Yes, you're probably going to lose weight, but that's not what it is. If you're doing the just weight loss, okay. And I always like to say that because for a few reasons. One, because some somebody will be like, oh, you're doing intermittent fasting. Of course, you're going to lose weight because you're just not eating calories. True, but that's not why we're doing it. And I'll get into wh why we're doing it in a moment. But the other thing is I don't like to make it a weight conversation because I have very thin people who are very unwell. And very heavy people who, are after we work together for a little bit of time, and we really haven't lost so much weight, are feeling great. So you can feel great at any size, and I want to make sure that we're not having a size conversation. So intermittent fasting. First of all, let's let's talk about the fact that we're not designed to eat all the time. We're just not designed to eat. God, universe, whatever, as you said earlier, we're not designed. Design. We were designed to be able to live without food. For X amount of time. We need water, but we need... Why? Because you have to hunt it and you have to gather it and there was no door debt. So how we're designed to do that is with this thing called gluconeogenesis. Fancy word for my body can produce its own sugar. Okay. So you have this ability and it's like a toggle switch. 
Sometimes I get food from the outside. Awesome. Great. And sometimes there is no food. My body will turn inward and my liver will take my fat and turn it into sugar, gluconeogenesis. So I can literally create my own fuel, which is glucose, from my own fat. And that toggle switch is what we call metabolic flexibility. It's really important. It's how we survived as a species because sometimes there was no food and we didn't drop dead after one meal, even though we feel sometimes like, oh my God, so hungry. <laughs> right? So, okay, so who cares, right? And now, as, but the thing is that in that time, when you are now using your internal stores, and during that time is when healing and repair happens. There's mm. a lot of magic. It's anti-inflammatory. Your body is just going to clean up and repair. And that is what we're looking for when we're talking about intermittent fasting. That's why it's not a weight loss conversation. We're looking to see that time window. And the longer you can do it, within reason, of course, the longer you could do it, the more benefit you get out of it. The problem for many of the people who are listening are like, oh my God, I don't know where to start. I just the thought of not eating, I get shaky. If you get shaky when you skip a meal, all that means is that you're so dependent on food, you are like a car that needs to get filled up every block. You can never buy a car like this. If you need to eat a meal like that, that means that you lost that switch. By the way, you can get it back, no worries. So you you doesn't have to be tomorrow. Some people can't do like, you know, I had like 16 hour fasting windows for most people. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. Start with 12. Remember, it includes your sleep. It means my last meal's at eight, go to sleep at 10. If I don't eat till 10, that's 12 hours, right? So start somewhere and then move the needle a half hour each time. It doesn't have to be automatically, but you'll discover that that shakiness goes away because when that shakiness goes away and you're like, fine, you've turned that metabolic flexibility back on and you are now able to switch between external sources of glucose and internal sources of glucose. I love that. And so that, uh, you know, obviously has to do with, you know, insulin sensitivity versus insulin resistance, switching that as well to where your body is much more sensitive to insulin. So besides using intermittent fasting for that, because it's obviously very helpful in that manner, is there anything else that you help your patients through to get that insulin sensitivity back? Uh, like how many meals a day, certain types of food, you know, are there macros that you lean more towards in order to help people get that sensitivity back? So first, let's describe insulin resistance. There's a good visual I like to use, which is every time you eat something, everything breaks down into glucose, more or less. It breaks down to glucose, and then insulin is like Uber. It picks up your glucose, and it drives it over to the cell. And the cell's like, thank you so much. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Keep eating another meal, another meal, another meal. And insulin picks it up, brings it to the cell, and the cell's like, nah, boo, I already got enough. Okay? That's insulin resistance. The cell saying... I don't want any more. It's resistant to insulin. That argument between the cell and insulin, by the way, is very inflammatory. So not only are you insulin resistant, and, but now there's inflammation. So now the insulin is like, oh my God, what do I do? I have this glucose in my Uber. I got to get rid of it. So if it drops it in the blood, that's diabetes. Finger stick goes up, that's diabetes. So it doesn't want to do that. So what does it start to do? It starts storing it in places. It starts storing it around your liver. That's fatty liver. It starts storing it in cholesterol. It starts storing it around your belly. It starts storing. So now you have the storage. So you will see people, before they become diabetic, they'll have the fatty liver. They'll have the cholesterol, the triglycerides elevated. That's basically your body trying to store it. And when it doesn't have any more room to store and you keep eating the glucose, it, there's like this overflow. And now we're on the land of diabetes. So now that we know what insulin resistance is, it's too much, it's excess, then to get insulin sensitive means to give it less, to starve. It just means to give it less, give it what it needs. This is why this is why fasting works because it's it's not constantly having that that delivery of food to the cell. There's a long period of time where insulin is not needed. It's, it's good. There's no there's no processing done. So the cell now is getting like ready when you're eating a meal. The cell's like, great, we're so excited for your delivery, right? So that is becomes insulin sensitive. The next part of it is choosing food. So if you're going to choose food that are constantly, you know, high carb density, again, versus maybe like things that take a longer time to to break down and maybe not everything breaks down to glucose if you have proteins break down to amino acids so if bringing proteins and fat then you again are not overloading the system but once you understand what insulin resistant is it becomes pretty obvious what to do to make it more sensitive when i started working with my patients because you asked me what are the foods i like i like to do intermittent fasting 
then I really almost always start on an elimination diet because my goal is not just insulin sensitivity, which will happen. My goal is to really calm down the belly. Okay. And, uh, you know, I have to ask, so when the, is it the t- typical functional medicine way of, you know, taking out, you know, gluten, eggs, meat, dairy? Uh, what are the foods that you find more inflammatory that once you see they've taken it out for a while, that's that's a great trigger food that they do better with that, at least until the belly heals. So I remove initially grains. So it's not enough to be gluten-free. Okay. Because you can have gluten-free Oreos. It's not enough. It's so not. <laughs> gluten-free is dangerous. You can eat a lot of nonsense and gluten-free. So I remo- eliminate all grains. So it's not even our station gluten-free. Dairy, legumes, unless you are vegan. Mm-hmm. Uh, legumes. And we really min- uh, minimize fruit as well because we're trying to get that insulin sensitivity and the reduction of inflammation. So we're basically looking at meat and fish, some veggies and like berries and fats. Very, very basic. This is not forever. And the reason I do that is because I want us to see, right? So you're coming in with a list of like 40 symptoms. How much of, how many of those symptoms will go go away just with elimination? 10, 20, 30? Great. Now we know that those are very connected to nutrition. Now we can work on the 10 that are left. What's left? Depending on what's left, will let me know where to go next, right? If you are more jointy, then I'm thinking live. If you are, you know, more hot flashy still, I'm thinking hormones. If you're more like headachey and fatigue, I think mold. But not everyone needs all those tests. Right. You're still GI and then I'm going to do a stool testing. So I would have to like eliminate, you know, get the weeds out so we could figure out what to do next. And that elimination diet for a certain amount of time really, really helps us kind of figure out what to do next. And people always ask me about, about meat. I am a fan of eating meat. The way I see my plate, the ideal plate is you start with your colors. Make sure the rain goes on it, not just in June all year round. <laughs> Real gay humor. Okay. So uh, if if you're listening at some point, just get in a picture of me and you'll understand everything. Okay. So, <laughs> so the rainbow on the plate and then some sort of protein. If you are not averse to eating meat, then good grass fed meat. And if you eat, are vegan, my wife tries to be more vegan, then we really have to decide which legumes to go. But that is how you look at your plate. So I'm not big on carnivore, but I'm, I prefer not to be vegan. I find it a little bit difficult to get the belly right because legumes sometimes are so irritating. That is where I land on what the plate should look like. Have you tried countless diets, but you're still seeking your nutrition sweet spot? Are you trying to get results on your health journey to feel your best without being too restrictive? Now, I know how you feel. I've done the diet thing, but there never was that one that totally worked for me. And this is exactly why I developed the MADE diet. Now, I found that rather than restrictions, it's best to have a set of guidelines that allow you to customize based on your preferences and bio-individuality while staying on track with your health and fitness goals. I found the nutrition sweet spot. And as a health and nutrition expert, I get asked all the time what, when, and how I eat. (laughs) And as someone who's passionate about education and helping others, I want to share that with you. Now, the Made Diet eBook lays it all out for you, taking the guesswork out of dieting. The Made Diet is a lifestyle plan that incorporates moderate protein, adequate fat, decreased carbs, and an introduction to intermittent fasting. The ebook gets right down to business by answering your most frequently asked questions. It includes thoughtfully designed recipes and a seven-day sample meal plan to start you off right. It will honestly kickstart your weight loss journey and have you losing inches in your very first week. Now, intermittent fasting combined with these nutritional guidelines is honestly the piece that so many people have been missing when trying to get results. This ebook has all the information you need in a format that is condensed and to the point so that you can get to your results. If you're ready to get started, the Made Diet ebook is available immediately on my website for just $9.99. So head over to melissamadeonline.com forward slash made diet to take action towards feeling your best today. And once you do, oh my gosh, please let me know it's working for you. I am so honored to be a part of your health journey. Okay, back to the show. I find that fascinating that the two, how long have you been married? 
Um, we are now, oh my God, I have to say, um, she's going to kill me. Ten years. <laughs> That's that's kind of challenging, I would think. Um, and I'm I'm sure that well, I have listeners that you know have their spouse or their partner is you know kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, have you found any way to make that really work for you? Are there any tricks of the trade? We're not really on opposite ends, and actually, I think it makes me a better provider because it makes me open. Because ultimately, in the center of it is to not have gluten, to not have dairy, to eat well, to fast, to really focus on getting the rainbow on, on our plate. And then where we differ is which protein we use. And it's not just ethical. For her, it's ethical. She really does not like to eat animals. But for me, I really cannot eat legumes. They really irritate me. They will flare me up immediately. So it's not even an option. Like I, I want to be as kind as her, but my body just doesn't, doesn't work with that. So it's really about, so that's really the only area we differ. So, you know, yeah, is, is, is the protein piece, but everything okay. else on the plate is the same. That's a that's a beautiful perspective. Really appreciate that. My daughter was vegan for many years, being the huge animal lover that she was. Didn't work for her as well. Um, it didn't make her very well, but um, she cer- certainly tried for that reason. I was very compassionate because I'm a huge animal lover as well. Mm-hmm. Talking about insulin sensitivity and resistance, you're doing such a, a bang up job of of explaining things and how to work with you know autoimmune disorders and stuff like that. Can you share a little bit? Um, Hashimoto's is obviously uh, an autoimmune disorder that that I feel from the clients that I work with is on the rise and uh, becoming something very common. Uh, what you can, you know, tell people in order for them to to live with it and to um, work with those symptoms because it, it can be quite debilitating. Yeah, I'm laughing because I usually draw a picture and then my staff finds my pictures all over because there's like a, it's a great way to describe it. But we can't draw pictures. We're in podcast land, so. <laughs> First of all, all autoimmunity is on the rise. Yeah. As a population, we're going to continuously get sicker uh, because we are not evolving as fast as all the toxins in our food and in our air. And so we cannot process it fast enough. Large majority of the population thinks they're processing it, meaning they're, they, they're not well or they think they're not. I mean, they're well or they think they're well. But the reason autoimmunity is on, rise, on the rise is because many of us really have trouble detoxifying all of this yeah. detoxifying does not mean go get a detox protocol for 30 days detoxifying means that your kidneys and your liver and your skin really cannot process all these chemicals and overload and then it creates an inflammation that's autoimmunity in general and and so since Hashimoto's is, is an autoimmune disease this is why we see it on the rise so what will happen with autoimmunity with Hashimoto's basically, remember we talked about the thyroid and the thyroid's job is to produce T4. And when you go to your doctor's office, there's going to be a measurement of TSH. If the TSH for some reason, by the way, TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormones. So this is what happens at some point. So T, the thyroid is supposed to produce T4. For some reason, and we'll get to why in a moment, your T4 goes down. Your brain freaks out and says, oh my God, we don't have enough T4 around. What should we do? Let's wake up the thyroid real, real quick. Thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. So it starts sending TSH down to the thyroid. Wake up, wake up, wake up. The thyroid happens to wake up and produce T4. Great. Usually it doesn't. So you'll go into the doctor's office and suddenly that TSH is high. A high TSH means your thyroid's not functioning. We're trying to wake it up. Thyroid stimulating hormone. People get confused. Why is my number high if it's not working? Your TSH is high. Your body's not producing enough T4. So the doctors are like, oh man, I have to give you medication. They give you T4. That's synthroid level of thyroxine. You get a level of thyroxine. You put it in your mouth, that's T4. Your brain calms down. It says, great, TSH normalizes. All is good with the world. You, take, you figure out how much T4 you need. Your TSH is fine. And that is the world of thyroid and conventional medicine. It is not wrong. You certainly need the medication, but it is not. We never asked why. Why is this happening? So we mm-hmm. go to remember those antibodies. The why is my body is attacking the thyroid. My body, how do I know? Because I have antibodies. I'm not supposed to have antibodies to the thyroid. I'm supposed to have antibodies to COVID, antibodies to measles. Why do I have an antibody to my thyroid? Well, your body is making a mistake and it is, you know, attacking the thyroid. Okay, why? Why? Because most of the time it's because you have a leaky gut. And then you eat gluten because who doesn't eat gluten until, until they're sick? And that gluten comes out and to into your system and your body's like, well, this is foreign. We should attack this gluten. And gluten, it has a very similar build to an enzyme in your thyroid. So there's this issue called molecular mimicry 
where the body's like, oh, well, gluten looks pretty similar to this. So every time you have your sandwich, you're a whole wheat turkey sandwich that you think is so unhealthy. Every time you have that sandwich, you're also attacking your thyroid. So anybody who's dealing with Hashimoto's, the first thing you need to do is stop eating gluten. The gluten and um, thyroid connection as well established, plenty of papers on it. Like, because you wanted to do is stop the assault. If you don't stop the assault, you're going to consistently need more and more medication. This is why, man, my last last year I was at 25 microgram with them at 50, now at 75, because you have to stop the assault. I just want to say that if we stop the assault, that does not mean you won't need medication. Damage done, unless it's the very beginning stages, you're probably going to be on medication for life, but we could stop it from worsening. And that is the goal with a lot of autoimmunity, either to stop it from worsening, reduce flare-ups, but not really, we don't really cure autoimmunity. We calm it down to the point where it feels like it's cured, but it's not cured. So if anyone's promised you a cure to autoimmunity, please run. Hopefully I answered your Hashimoto's question. Yeah. And so I, I just really quick want to go back to gluten because, you know, in the world of social media, you've got a lot of, you know, medical professionals and people in the nutrition space that will say, you know, it's best to kind of, you know, do without it. And then you've got others that will say, hey, it's, you know, there's, you know, honestly, a joke about it, like, you know, the Gen, Gen X never was, you know, sensitive to gluten and stuff like that. Uh, and so I just, I'm curious your thoughts when, when you're thinking of like my kids, my kids are 20, ugh, 27 and 28 years old at that age. Do you think even gluten so that my daughter, you know, when she's my age, her thyroid is stronger, should watch that gluten at that age? Or what are your thoughts on that? generally speaking, for the healthy population, should they watch their gluten or is it really just for people that have the propensity to have these autoimmune disorders or uh, maybe because the, overall their general health isn't where it should be? Those are the people that should watch their gluten. Uh, what are your thoughts on gluten? Okay. So f <laughs> the first part is like the older generation wasn't, doesn't have, first of all, how do we know? Yeah. All right, we were looking at, but second of all, we also, a generation or two ago, ate less gluten. Yes. Ate less meals. The gluten was different. Our grains were different. Like everything has changed. Um, our food sourcing has changed. So, and so the first part is I'm going to object to how many people really are gluten sensitive even back then. Mm -hmm. And the second objection is it's not the same gluten anyway. So it's irrelevant to go, to go there. As far as what we should watch, you know, it's the reason that everyone is gluten sensitive is because not everyone has a leaky gut. So when you're younger, you tend not to have a leaky gut. But I guess the question is, how will you know? It's complicated also with age. Like I don't take on patients younger than 35 because you're under 35. Unless you're really, really unwell, you're not willing to give up gluten. So like why torture these children? My oldest is 26 also. <laughs> you know, and I've been she was, she was, she was around me and she's just like, okay, I'm not doing this. You know, they want pizza and want to have beer. So unless they're really unwell, yeah. Are you going to torture them? But, and you need some motivation. You need to see like it's feeling better. Yeah. So the problem is that we don't know when the leaky gut, we can know retroactively when the leaky gut started. My patient will say ever since X, I haven't felt well, ever since COVID, ever since the, the birth of my child, ever since the divorce. So we know the trigger ever since then. And so they were living a certain way and eating a certain way. And then the, the trigger, you know, maybe they had a car accident or a concussion. So anything can trigger a leaky gut and now you're in trouble that you're eating that. And and that's the issue. We don't know when that will happen to anyone. So for the younger generation, I would say unless they're dealing with an autoimmunity, you know, it's it's hard to torture these young ones. <laughs> I hate to do it to them. Everywhere, yes. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. I've had college kids come to me. I really stopped doing it because it's like the kid's miserable. Yeah. The, the kids are miserable, especially when they're in college and they're trying it. And like sometimes the parents are like so gung ho, and I'm like, have you ever been to like a college cafeteria? My son's in college now. I'm like, there's nothing to eat there. So, so you have to, everything in medicine, everything in life is risk reward. So how much of the reward is this child going to get if we have them on this restricted diet? Someone with Hashimoto, the, re, the reward, you know, is, is right there. So you have to, it's individual. Yeah. Okay. So the last question I have for you um, about uh, nutrition uh, is if you would, because this is also another common one that I get that I hear a lot about uh, fibromyalgia. Um, mm. You do you work with a lot of patients uh, that suffer from that, and is there anything that they can do um, on a more holistic level to help with that pain? Yes, don't accept the diagnosis. Uh -huh. uh, okay, I got so much slack of this on TikTok. Um, so <laughs> good for you. <laughs> like, oh my. 
So let me say this. Of course, I believe you that you are not really. People are like, people like you don't validate it. I'm like, no, I'm the super validator of what you're feeling. Everything you're feeling is real. I'm the super validator. Of course, you're in pain. Of course, everything you're saying is real. I have no, there's no question that it's not in your head. It's the name of my damn book. It's not in your head. So I am 100% your ally. But accepting that diagnosis, it's an end of a conversation. Here's what happens to the diagnosis. So yes, there's criteria for the diagnosis. And they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. There's a criteria. Of course, I know the criteria. I, I know the criteria. And it's, it's we all know it's a diagnosis with exclusion. You make sure there's no autoimmunity. Uh, you look for certain things that's not there. There's a new test out there that shows some inflammatory markers. And everyone was very excited. There's a fibromyalgia test. It just shows inflammation. There's nothing to be there. So basically, you're a patient with a lot of pain. You don't have anything else that we know about. You have inflammation. You get fibromyalgia. Here's the problem. First of all, in conventional medicine, I'm going to tell you the truth, whether you want to hear you or not. You walk into your next doctor and you say fibromyalgia, they're already not listening to you. You're done. You're done. In conventional medicine, fibromyalgia, you might as well have like, I'm crazy on your forehead. Wow. So, so don't even say it. Don't even say, hold on, hold on to it, put it in your pocket because now no one's listening to you. So first of all, conventional medicine. Second of all, once that happens, the provider already has the sense that a lot of people, rheumatology, everyone already looked at you and said, it was fine. I'm not going to look any further. You have fibromyalgia. You've ended the conversation of figuring out what is going on with you. And it's, this is not going to work to your advantage because it's not like there's, they're offering you a cure. They're offering anxiety medications, anti-spasm medication, you know, uh, monster relaxer. They're not really, what are they offering you with this, with this name? It's not a good name. It's not a good diagnosis to have. So you're in pain. Let's figure out what's going on. Why are you in pain? Have you explored Lyme? Have you explored mold? How is your microbiome? How deep did you go in your micro microbiome? Have you, um, is there, do we need like limbic vagal uh, nerve therapy because you, you're so dysregulated? Like you, there is so much more that can be done way out of conventional medicine. That is so important. And here's the other thing. A lot of my patients in the I don't feel good itis, which is basically fibromyalgia, it just means you're pre-disease. Given enough time, we're going to get a diagnosis of lupus from arthritis. The problem is that those autoimmune markers, they come out late. You can have painful joints for 10 years, and every time you get tested for rheumatoid arthritis, it's negative. It's called seronegative autoimmunity. So how do you know, just because everything is negative, that you're not on your way to cooking something? So so don't accept the diagnosis. Say, thank you so much. Thank you. What that means, this is good news. What that means is that you haven't found anything pathological. I'm not dying. There's no cancer. This is really good news. Take that. Awesome. And then go find a functional medicine provider that is going to dig with you until we find the answer. Don't stop till you find it because there's no reason for you to feel this way. I see how passionate I get about this. I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry. I know. I I love that. And I, I love how you empower people with that because, it, I mean, you get that diagnosis and you can just visually see someone go, okay, you know, defeated. And um, you you empower instead of uh, put people in that state of defeat. Um, so I'm more concerned of the people who are, who are happy with the diagnosis. They're like, oh, I finally have the diagnosis. No, you don't. You're right. That, that gets me more concerned. If you're defeated, then maybe you're going to keep looking because you know it's not enough. But the people who are like, oh, you finally solved it. I've solved nothing. I've just given, an, I've given a Latin name. Your muscles hurt. It's all I've done. That's very true. <laughs> a fancy name. I was great. You um, are obviously uh, very gifted in your field, but not only in the nutritional space and the medicine, but you're quite the entrepreneur and quite the business menace too. And I know I have a lot of followers who are entrepreneurs as I am myself. I've uh, been working for me, myself, and I for over 15 years. And uh, lastly, I, I just completely want to pivot, um, just shake you on the shoulder real quick and say, okay, next subject, um, yeah. which, which is random uh, for me to do. But I would just love for you to share with women out there um, business. You know, Do you have any business advice um, for us that are, you know, the times have changed, you know, things are different. Uh, you even, I, I won't even have you go into long COVID, but you even specialize in that. But just times have changed. And, you know, what's going on in the world right now is pretty crazy. Uh, but people do want to take good care of themselves. They want to take good care of their families. 
I listened to a gentleman today who said something uh, that I hope oh, I don't mutilate, but he said that people these days are working toward being average at something and then hoping to get paid well for it. And I was like, wow, that's really profound. <laughs> you can't, you know, it, especially with, I guess, the social media world, uh, you can't just be average at something and expect to excel at it. That was kind of my takeaway for, I guess, my business of the day. But can you share with us just some tips that you have that have helped you along the way to become quite the businesswoman that you are? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I own four. I own four companies. And first and foremost, if you're an entrepreneur, you know you're an entrepreneur. Like, I don't think there's enough money in the world to have me punch in and punch out. It doesn't fit. I've tried. I don't do well in that environment. If you are someone that knows that about yourself, just just own it. And you all, and for those of you listening who are not that person, don't try to become that person. Like my wife would never be an entrepreneur. Oh my gosh! I yes, love working in it in, in within the scope of an institution, and it really fills her. I agree. And when I hear her meetings, I actually my blood pressure goes up. I'm like, no one's doing anything. It's just like it takes time. I was like, okay, so it's free. Yeah. So I lecture at the local college, and I and I tell and for nurse practitioners, and I'm like, at the end of what I say, you're either going to know 100 percent you want to do. Or you're going to be absolutely nauseous with everything I'm saying, and both are correct. So ah. just, that's the first thing is like know that about yourself. If if this, if you're not waking up in the morning like ah oh, I want to do this, even I'm willing to take the risk, I'm willing to risk it all, and that and that if that doesn't feed you, if like is your then don't do it. Don't try to be something you're not, and just be the best freaking employee in the world because we need amazing people in the workforce that are proud of their job who take it to the next level. Because you could be an entrepreneur if you don't have an implementer. It's not going to work after you. So be the best. Like my wife is the best employee to have in the world. It's like you want her on your team. So be the, just be the best at it. So the, for entrepreneurs, I would say this. It's all about systems. It is not really about the goal. It is about what are you doing every day to mm. where you're going. So let's just be real simple, right? I, I want to save $100,000. Are how much are you going to save every single day to get to hundred thousand? You're not going to sit there and go, I hope I win the lotto. Every you're going to say in the next five years, one hundred thousand. And so, what does that mean? Twenty eight dollars a day, and every day you're going to do that system. I want to be great. I want to have a lot of followers on Instagram. You got to post all the time and, and have a system around it. Like my Tuesdays is my social media day. I, I and I dedicate and I try not to plan anything else. Tuesdays a day, I film the TikToks, I film the YouTube, I film the, it's, and you do it. And a year later, you have a year's worth of content. It's systems. Every time someone gives me an idea, talk to my team, I'm like, that's a great idea. How are we breaking this down into the daily so that in a month or two, we could see what we did for it? You're never going to have a block of time. You're never going to have a big chunk of money come from somewhere. It's all in the small steps that you take consistently, consistently, consistently every day. And then suddenly you're there. So create a system. And do it every single day religiously. And that's true for everything. You want to lose weight? Half a pound a week if it's too nice. You want you want to save money? A dollar a day. Whatever it takes. One of the Starbucks a day. Whatever you, wherever you are. You want a better marriage? It's a, it's a compliment every single day, right? Um, it's, a, right? it's all of it. You want a better body? It's moving. And moving doesn't mean going to CrossFit. When I first started running, I couldn't even run down the block. It's a little, it's the little pieces of time are going to get you there and they're manageable when they're small. And if you keep doing it every day, every day, every day, if it feeds you, mm -hmm. if it takes away from you, you might not be an entrepreneur and just know that that's okay. Yeah. I love that. And I think that obviously celebrating small wins uh, along the way or small victories along the way uh, really play into that consistency being something that you enjoy. Um, Sometimes goals are so big that you- they're so big that you're just like, I, I'll never get there. But if you break them down into bite-sized pieces, one of my mentors has, she calls it the push book. She wants you to have this huge push goal, but then she teaches you how to break it into smaller goals so that you can celebrate along the way to reach that big push goal, which I think is obviously very important. You obviously practice what you preach. You're very successful uh, in everything that you do. And uh, I ordered- you know, you're all about the successful. I'm not successful at everything I do. I have a few failed businesses. I want to put it out there. Oh, I love that. And I've learned from every one of them. I have t-shirts of a lot of brands that never went anywhere. So you just I just don't write them in my bio. And and that's the real deal, right? And sometimes yeah. I up on my nutrition and sometimes I don't work out. And like all of that is real, but I get up and I start again the next day. So I appreciate it. I'm always successful, but I'm definitely not always successful. Ask my wife. <laughs> 
that they're quick to remind, right? <laughs> but but I just feel so blessed to have got to know you a little bit and uh, looking forward to reading your book. Um, and if you would share uh, with my audience where they could find you, you were very easy to find on Instagram, uh, obviously, because your name is one of a kind. So you won't have any <laughs> trouble finding you on Instagram. But where else uh, that they can find you uh, to learn more about you and what you offer? I appreciate it. So it's called The New Method and new is spelled with a K because you always knew there was a better way. I say that all the time. It's so funny. So it's The New Method everywhere. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, podcast, um, everywhere except for Twitter because I talk too much. And um, just, and we have people who are constantly reading comments. They're, you know, whatever. So you reach us anywhere. And there's also a website, wherever you find, wherever you want, wherever you are, we're there. Yeah. So being an entrepreneur and, and an expert in your field, uh, before I let you go, do you have anything in the works? Is there anything that you're doing right now to just get to that next level? Um, there's there's actually two things in the works. Um, one of my companies, is, if any of you guys listening are nurse practitioners, one of my companies is called EEG Prep. We have educational seminars, but we're launching it now to make it a little bit more accessible for affordability. Uh -huh. and, um, and then at the new method, we're also creating more content because not everyone can come in at a certain price point. So we want to make sure should I away from that because I didn't want to be that person that's like $99 for this. And I don't necessarily like to watch videos, but there are a lot of people who that is their price point and they love watching videos. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get comfortable with that. So we're launching that as well. So people can digest it. And there's a lot of DIY that you can do on your own as long as you have access to information. So those are the two things we're working on right now. I love that. And so you guys... It I'm going to binge. I got I got the afternoon to myself. So I'm going to be doing a lot of binging. And I just wanted to thank you so much. I just really genuinely love the way that you explain things and uh, how kind you are. And you have not an ill word to say about anything or anyone. Uh, and being that's very um, wonderful to to hear. I, I, I see a lot these days, um, a little bit of um, self-righteousness, I guess. <laughs> That's happening with people that are at your um, expertise levels. And I think it's wonderful that you still stay stay so humble and so um, accessible to so many people. So uh, I'm really glad that we met. I know. Yeah. The most meaningful compliment ever. I appreciate that so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's very true. And um, I hope we get the opportunity to talk and, and or work again real soon. And you guys, I'm just going to say it now. You're welcome. <laughs> I know, I know, I know I, the messages because these always air on Monday morning. The messages that come in on a Monday when I got a good one, I'm going to be flooded. So, um, Dr. E, thank you so much. And uh, your time was uh, very much appreciated. And for everybody else um, listening, I hope you wake up feeling prepared and that you go to bed feeling proud. <laughs>